A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. The word of God continued to spread and to gain followers. Barnabas and Saul completed their task and came back from Jerusalem, bringing John Mark with them. In the church at Antioch, the following were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene. Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. One day, while they were offering worship to the Lord and keeping a fast, the Holy Spirit said, I want Barnabas and Saul set apart for the work to which I have called them. So it was that after fasting and prayer, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So these two, sent on their mission by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and from there sailed to Cyprus. They landed at Salamis and proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. John acted as their assistant. The word of the Lord. The response to the psalm. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. O God, be gracious and bless us, and let your face shed its light upon us. So will your ways be known upon earth, and all nations learn your saving help. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and exult, for you rule the world with justice. With fairness you rule the peoples, you guide the nations on earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. May God still give us his blessing till the ends of the earth revere him. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Alleluia, alleluia. You believe, Thomas, because you can see me. Happy are those who have not seen and yet believe. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus declared publicly, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in the one who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees the one who sent me. I, the light, have come into the world so that whoever believes in me need not stay in the dark any more. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them faithfully, it is not I who shall condemn him, since I have, not, I have come not to condemn the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and refuses my words has his judge already. The word itself that I have spoken will be his judge on the last day. For what I have spoken does not come from myself, no, what I was to say, what I had to speak, was commanded by the Father who sent me. And I know that his commands mean eternal life, and therefore what the Father has told me is what I speak. The Gospel of the Lord. I was offering yesterday the idea that as Eastertide continues and we continue to be given these passages from John's Gospel, where that's pointing us now is towards the words, and we see them again here from Jesus today, towards the mystery of the Father. So the whole of our Eastertide journey is now converging on, on, on who the Father is, who Jesus is revealing the Father to be. And so therefore all of our work at entering into the Paschal mystery of dying and rising again with Jesus, being born again with Jesus, being born from above through the Spirit with Jesus, sharing this resurrected life uh, is all about leading us to the Father um, because that's the relationship that Jesus has and he describes it uh, very well here that uh, in a mysterious way he's, he's trying to get us to take our eyes off him. Um, strangely uh, said, of course, Jesus is at the very center of our faith, but he's saying, actually, I'm not. See through me to the Father. 
That's the one I'm really trying to, you know, get, get you interested in uh, and get you into a relationship with because that's what Jesus has with his father. He does only what his father says. It's the father who sent him. He's doing everything for his father, with his father, and he wants to open that up uh, for us. And, and he says here about being, you know, those who are judged or condemned. Uh, he says, it's not me that's going to condemn them. It's just my words. And what does he mean by that? He's saying that the, the point of this life, if you stop and ask, well, why am I here? Why is all this here? What's it for? If you're inclined to ask that question, that that, that, that question begins to be the key that unlocks the fact that, yes, you're here to realize this great truth that you have a Father in heaven, that he created it for you, and that you're journeying to meet him. You're seeing signs of him all along the way, but that's just, uh, as it were, anticipatory. That's preparing you to want to know more and to live according to what this, who this Father is and how he wants you to live and what he knows about your life. So all of that is, is what Jesus is trying to open up. And he says, if you're, if you're close to that, if, you, if, you, if being in this world is just not enough to make you ask that question, then my words are just like water on a stone. They're, they're, they're not going to reach you. And in a sense, you, you're condemned by that. Not condemned by God, as it were, but by condemned by your lack of interest in what this life was for. Uh, and where true help and true love and truth come from. So this is what Eastertide is, is, is pointing us towards. And, and as we go towards Eastertide, it will, it, will, it will culminate in the Feast of the Ascension. So Jesus goes back to his Father, but he says, I will be with you always. So he's with us in his church. He's with us in his word. He's with us uh, in the Mass, especially with the Bread of Life, which has been part of our teaching in John's Gospel. Um, he's, he's with us in our hearts and especially through the Holy Spirit. So the next big feast will be Pentecost, when the, the, the church is ignited to be, gone, to be sent out into the world, to, to, to reveal this gospel, to call people to know the Father, to heal their lives, to bring them together as a family under one Father and in one church. So it's, a, it's an august and, and tremendous vision that we're, that's laid out for us. If we, if we bring in our saint of today, Saint Louis-Marie Grignon de Montfort, um, and ask what, why, why the church remembers him, what's his contribution? Well, as I said at the start, he was a, a zealous missionary priest, so he was made apostolic missionary. He went around giving parish missions. Uh, he did a lot of the work um, that was necessary in Brittany, particularly it's thought to defend against what was happening throughout the rest of Europe, which was raj, a, a very large Protestant influence. So. Christian, but taking away that sense of the one true flock. It was a great moment of woundedness that arrived in the church and, 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 and different interpretations of theology, no doubt. Um, and, but Brittany seemed to be largely protected from that. It's really kept a, a sense of the faith, at least it, it did. Um, and, and St. Louis was, was largely credited for that. But he, he had a, a particular approach. After doing his parish missions for a while, he realized that he would get people all fired up in the faith and then he'd have to leave and and quite often be, human beings being what they are that, that fervor kind of then frittered away and he wanted to leave them something more substantial so he developed a way of teaching um, that drew on his understanding of who our lady is in our catholic tradition and what role she plays as our spiritual mother uh, and this led to this writing of this book called the true devotion to mary and he understood that somehow mary had been given to us precisely to help us to know the Father. Uh, and this has been the instinct of the Catholic faith, and that became one of the bones of contention, of course, at the time of the, the, the Protestant uh, uh, ideas arising, that somehow the Catholic focus on Mary was taking away from the unique significance of Jesus and therefore the unique significance of coming to know the Father. But think how God has laid out our lives. You know, it doesn't always work like this, but how has God laid out our lives? Our first, most primary experience of reality and truth and love come through a father and mother. Of course, we, as I say, we don't, it doesn't always happen. But that's, that's what we sort of basically understand. So God, God reveals already this kind of, this, this duality in reality for us between a mother and a father. And would we say that if one loves a mother, it's somehow not loving a father. No, that doesn't make sense. You love the mother for who the mother is. 
And actually, the greater the love between the mother and the father, and the more that they share, and the more that they're a complete entity, the more full our experience of love is, and our love for our mother and our father grows, and that's surely God's plan. Again, doesn't always happen, we know, because of the woundedness of sin uh, and the fragility of our wounded nature. But this is what God wants to, to, to draw out of human life more and more. So the Catholic instinct has been, no, Mary helps us to understand. She helps us to understand who Jesus is because no one has known Mary like Jesus. No one has been more open to the plan of God than Mary, letting this Holy Spirit become so much part of her vocation and her life that Jesus was made flesh, conceived inside of her. That's the model for all Christian life, that Jesus would be made flesh in your life and mine, that we would continue this work uh, of the fathers through Jesus. So no one has done that like Mary. And, and therefore, to entrust ourselves to Mary is not to risk, uh, as it were, not entrusting ourselves to God. Uh, and St. Louis saw this, and he, he, um, he pursued this really perhaps more than any other priest had done before, and he came up with this, this devotional book, True Devotion to Mary, trying to lay out how that would look in someone's life. And St. Louis, Louis found that actually this did help people to keep hold of something after he'd done his missions, um, but he led them through this means back to their baptismal vows. So it was Mary that was to help us to live the vows that were made either for us or by us at our baptism, to reject evil and to embrace the creed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Catholic Church. And that it was Mary that was going to, that was her role as spiritual mother, to help us to live our lives, to help us to understand the love of the Father by conversely uh, relating to us and helping us as a mother. And that that would complete our sense of being a family in the church, but also the ultimate mystery of the family, as it were, of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so Mary um, has, has been understood to help us in, in, in that work. We're just about to, as well as Eastertide and uh, the Great Feast coming, we're about to enter into the month of May. And this has been a particularly treasured month where we draw closer to Mary uh, during that month. Perhaps it's the, the fact that the nature and spirit springtime are showing all that sort of fruitfulness and new life and joy and the blossoms and the nature is waking up that that speaks to us of the fruitfulness of the mother Mary almost like mother earth in a sense but understood in a Christian sense it's not the earth that's our mother God is our ultimate source of life but Mary speaks to us of that motherhood in God that nurturing emerging generating love um, and so Mary can lead us to the father as well just a final point to say the significance of this book, the, of True Devotion to Mary. St. Louis was, was not a popular man, strangely, at the time, as it would often seem. People who really preached reform of life and, and really sort of didn't hold back and didn't care what people think, thought. Um, he was poisoned at some point, and it's thought that that probably contributed towards his death. I think he was about 53 when he died. Um, so people took against him. They didn't like this man coming into their town and telling them to stop drinking and stop carousing and reform their lives and get with God. Uh, strangely, it wasn't popular uh, with some. Um, and he said that this book that he'd written, True Devotion to Mary, was actually going to, be, it was going to be attacked by evil spirits, as it were, and it would be buried in people's consciousness. And he said it, 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 people will forget about it. And that's what happened. It was discovered something over 100 years later at the bottom of a chest, and someone said, hang on, this is, it was in one of the houses of the religious order that he began. I said, this is, this sounds like it was written by our holy founder. Um, and, it, and it then had tremendous success. It spread throughout the world. It really categorized and, and helped define something new uh, in the church's understanding about Mary's role. And just as an example of its fruitfulness, it found itself in the 20th century into the hands of one young Karol Wojtyla, uh, a young seminarian uh, in Poland during the war, and he said that book changed his life. That book changed his life. Now that young seminarian was ordained, he went on to become Archbishop of Krakow, and he became Pope St. John Paul II. And for his papal motto, he chose an M for Mary with a cross above it, so uniting Mary and Jesus, and he chose the phrase, totus tuus, totus tuus, for the motto for his whole papacy. And totus tuus was a phrase taken from Louis de Montfort, and it, may, it means all yours. And it was directed to Mary. I'm all yours, Mary. I'm all yours. A total act of, of fidelity and love towards the mother of God. Why? Because that's what, Jesus, that's what God did 
when he gave Jesus his most precious gift to Mary, when he sent the Holy Spirit to her, and he, he came to her into her life as a father through Jesus, effectively God gave everything to Mary, for her, but also for us. So following God's example to give everything to Mary is the way that we understand uh, a greater fullness of all that the gospel is revealing to us. So John Paul II, a great example of the fruitfulness. Sometimes the fruitfulness of our lives won't be seen, maybe for three centuries later. We hope to see a bit along the way, but we never know what God is doing in the future. So, lovely feast day to have in our Easter tide. So let's pray for the intercession of St. Louis de Montfort that we would develop that filial, tender love for the mother of Jesus and our mother, and that she would help us uh, to be part of this family of the church, coming more and more to know God as our Father.